So over the past couple of weeks, we've been dealing and engaging with these imaginary members of Grace Mount Community Church. Remember these guys? And we've had some fun with it. But it's been helpful as we've looked at what the Apostle Paul was saying to this church in Corinth a couple of thousand years ago to help us see how would that apply, what would that look like in the life of Grace Mount Community Church. Because it's the same good news, same gospel, but it's also the same types of people. We face the same struggles, the same temptations. And so this is useful for us, right? So if you remember, we had Jeffrey. Remember what was going on with Jeffrey, chapter 5? Right? He was at it with his stepmom, and we shocked you that week. Last week, we saw two guys. Remember their names? Barnaby <coughs> and Norman, right? We've been trying to pick names that are unlikely to walk into our church in Grace Mount. Uh, and what was the deal with Norman and Barnaby? Car. Right, the car, right? So Barnaby had shafted Norman. He'd not been paying up for the car that he bought off him. And... Uh, Norman had taken it out into the scheme for justice. We're going to have another one this week, so I'm up for you guys choosing a name, just to keep you interested. So if give me a name, and we're going to walk through the new scenario for 1 Corinthians 6. Max? Bob. Bob. I think we could have a Bob that comes to church. So I think we need a... Let's go for something else. Roderick. That is a great name. Selway's up for that one? No. Baby Roderick Selway? Right, let's go for, let's go for Roderick, right? And you're going to see in the rest of chapter 6 that Roderick, who's a member of Grace Mount Community Church, he's one of us, has been regularly and is continuing to sleep with prostitutes. Now, what are we saying? What would we do as a church if it emerged and it came to light that Roderick, one of our members, is visiting broth- brothels or hiring prostitutes? Is that behaviour inconsistent with what it means to be a Christian? Maybe that'll help us to ask the question, what impact would becoming a Christian have on our sex life? Or, when I become a Christian, what does that mean about how I view and how I use my body? Now these questions bring us back to this question of, and Paul's emphasis on, when you believe in Jesus, that increasingly and gradually starts to affect your behaviour. And these two things in the life of a Christian, what you believe about Christ and how you behave, are to go hand in hand. Now this issue with Roderick, good name, is what Paul is addressing in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. And he starts off, as we're going to see, a little bit on the defensive, because Roderick and other guys in the church have got some excuses and slogans that they are firing at Paul. So look at chapter 6, verse 12. Slogan number one, I have the right. Verse 12, I have the right to do anything, you say. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything. But I will not be mastered by anything. So here is Paul quoting what he's heard people in Corinth say. Whether it's a kind of slogan, whether it's an excuse, they are saying, my body, my rights... They're saying, I can do whatever I want. I am the Lord, I am the lady of my life. Maybe this is Roderick, maybe doing it a little bit more kind of spiritual, and he's saying this, I'm forgiven anyway. Jesus has washed me clean, and so as forgiven, I am free to do anything. All right, it's as if Roderick's saying, my private sex life has nothing to do with the church's public life. It's my right. Now the Apostle Paul takes his stand against that declaration of rights and says, although that may be a right in Corinth and it may be a right in Grace Mount, it is wrong when it comes to being a Christian. He says to them, if you're a Christian, you stand not on your individual rights, but you lay your life down for the benefit of others. See, he says, you say, I have the right to do anything. Paul counters that by saying... Not everything is beneficial. See, he says, being a Christian is not just about me and what I deserve or what is my right, but he says a Christian lives their life based on what will benefit his community. If you think back to chapter 1 of Corinthians, one of the principles we set up was a Christian thinks not in terms of I, but in terms of we. 
But he also says to them, if you're a Christian, you don't just stand on your own rights as your own little lord or lady, but you bow down to only one master. He quotes it again. I have the right to do anything. He says, no, no, I will not be mastered by anything. Why does he say that? Because he's already established a Christian is someone who says what? Jesus is Lord. And if he is Lord, then I can have no other master. I cannot be mastered by anything else. So the culture is not my master. My sex drive is not my master. My partner is not my master. My master is Jesus. And so as Paul kind of stands on the defensive and he hits this, out, this kind of objection, I have the right to do anything, he sets up two kind of bumpers like a bowling alley and says, no, for the Christian, their behavior comes between these two things. Will it benefit my community? And will it obey my master, Jesus? It's not a bad place to start when you're thinking about anything in the Christian life. Does it help and benefit my Christian brothers and sisters? Does it obey my master, Jesus? But then Roderick comes back and he says, right, if you're not having that obligation, here's another one I've got on my sleeve. Look at verse 13. You say, and this is Paul quoting Roderick and other people in Corinth, food for the stomach, stomach for food. God will destroy them both. But look how Paul replies. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, Roderick's attitude here is a little bit like this. He's saying, listen, my body needs food. And just like my body needs food, my body needs sex. If I'm hungry, I'll have some sandwiches. If I'm horny, I'll have some sex. It's not a right or wrong thing. It's not a moral thing. It's just an appetite thing. And he says, he takes it to the spiritual realm, which is also always a clever thing to do when you're trying to excuse sin. Oh, well, God's going to destroy my body anyway. My soul is what matters. See, his tactic is trying to create a distance between what you do with your body and what you do in your spiritual life. Roderick's playing this game. Sure, my soul belongs to Jesus, but my body is my playground, so it's my rules, because God is going to destroy it anyway. Sounds clever, sounds spiritual, but listen to what Paul says, because he doesn't leave any loopholes for Roderick to kind of wiggle out of. What does he say? Your body is not merely for sandwiches. It is not merely for sex. It is certainly not for sexual immorality. Your body is for who? For? Don't look at me. Look at the Bibles. What does it say? It is for the big fella. It is for the Lord. If you are a Christian, Roderick, if you are a Christian, your body belongs to Jesus. Which means what you do with it will show whether or not Jesus is your Lord. It will show whether or not you are benefiting your community. It will show whether or not you are mastered by something or someone else. Paul is not having these slogans. It's my right. It's going to be destroyed anyway. He says, no, no, no. Your body is for the Lord. But Paul's not content to kind of remain on the ropes, on the defensive. And so for the rest of the chapter, he gets away from their objections and their slogans and he comes onto the front foot and he wants to show Roderick and the rest of our church four massively important things when it comes to understanding your body and its relationship to sex. Now this is important for us as Christians living in a culture that wants us to put our identity in our body image. Because just like Corinth, we live in a community that says, if you are not sexually attractive, then you're at the bottom of the pile. If you're not sexually active, then you're less than human. And if you're not sexually tolerant, then you're a blight on society. And so we need to hear this. This is a place where, as again we've spoken of in Corinthians so far, we must not think like Corinthians, we've got to think like Christians. This is a place where we need God to inform our minds, correct our ingrained conclusions, and reshape our values. So Paul's going to show us four things all about our bodies. They're on your sheets. You've got blanks. Here's number one. Verse 14. Your body will be raised. Verse 14. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. So to get himself onto the front foot, he goes to the fundamentals of what a church believes. Jesus Christ, God's Son, came to earth 
as a human being and took a physical body just like your body. And in that body, Jesus Christ died for your sins. And in that body, Jesus was raised from the dead. But here's the important part that Paul wants to take you to. Because of him becoming human, dying as a human, but being raised from the dead, what is Paul's conclusion? If you put your faith in Jesus, you will be raised in a body just like his. Which means if you're a Christian, the destiny of your body is not just to decay in a grave or to sit as a little tub of ashes on your mantelpiece. The destiny of your body is what? Resurrection. Resurrection. Your body is destined for eternity. It is not irrelevant. And so he looks Roderick square in the eye and he says this. Roderick, Roddy old chum, a body that is destined for resurrection should not be used for behavior worthy of hell. What is going to be upgraded in resurrection should not be used now in a way that degrades it in immorality. What it will be later determines how we use it now. Now, this is a crap illustration, but see if it works. Charlie's getting married, right? A week on... So, a week on Saturday. Now, Sally's already got her dress, right? She's got it here. She's going to take it on the plane. Imagine Sally came to church this morning in her wedding dress. And she was putting out the chairs... She served tea and coffee. She got the communion wine ready. Then afterwards, she tidied everything up. She hoovered and then jumped in Charlie's smelly car. What are you going to say to Charles, to Sally? What are you going to say to her? What is wrong with you? What your dress is going to be used for should determine what you do with it now. You keep it in one of those big plastic bag things. You have a mothball in it and all these kind of things to make sure that it is pristine for that day. Okay, I'm not going to go there in case we create some kind of domestic argument. And I was going to make a joke about it in case she gets married again, but let's not go there. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, what, what it is to be used for in the future, what is to become of it, should determine how you use it now. Which means, Roderick, if you are destined to be raised with Jesus and spend eternity with Jesus... You should not use your body now in a way that would take you to hell. Do you see the point? Listen, your body is not irrelevant when it comes to the good news of Jesus. One of the reasons Jesus came, Jesus died, Jesus rose was for your body. So do not write it off as unimportant. It is of fundamental importance. That's number one. Number two, your body is a member of Christ. Look at verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Don't you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Now, do you see how Paul describes the relationship between a Christian and Christ? He says, you are intimately connected. You are a member of him. You are part of him. So much so that you now cannot think of Jesus without thinking of you, and you cannot think of you without thinking of Jesus. See, to Jesus, you are not like a phone, which he sometimes takes in his hand. You are like a thumb that is always a part of him. But if that is the case, always, constantly, forever united with Jesus, if you come in a package deal with Jesus, like two fingers of a Kit Kat, that means that if you unite yourself with a prostitute, you are not just uniting you and her, you are uniting you, Jesus, and her. Roderick, you are putting Jesus into bed with a prostitute. Now, that is a shocking statement, isn't it? That is a scandalous thing for Paul to throw into this church's laps. But Paul wants you to be shocked. 
Because although this may be normal in Corinth or normal in Gracemount, it is not to be normal for a Christian. If your body is a member of Christ, then it is scandalous to use that same body for sexual immorality. Paul says, never. Never. You should never be comfy with sexual immorality. You ought to be shocked. Look at verse 16, because here's his reasoning. Here's the logic. Verse 16 reads, Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. Here's what Paul is saying. Sex is not something that is designed for a one-night stand with a stranger. But it is to create a one-flesh union with a lifelong spouse. See, just as your body is for the Lord, so sex is for something. It is created, given by God, to create this oneness with your all in for all time, forsaking all others, husband or wife. And it is within that marriage relationship that God gives sex to create and to continue that one fleshness between one man and one woman for life. That is what sex is for. It comes with instructions. Which means that sexual immorality is when you take sex out of that marriage oneness. Now I get, right, we're not all Christians in the room, and that means that you may, as a non-Christian, draw the line between right and wrong when it comes to sexuality somewhere else. That's fine. What you do need to know is that on Judgment Day, God will not judge you by your standard of morality, but His. As your maker, He makes the rules. But if you are a Christian then your body is for the Lord and it is a member of Christ and your behavior will increasingly fall into line with that belief. And so sex for the Christian is given to create that lifelong oneness between a husband and a wife. Anything outside of that, Jesus says, Paul says, is immorality. And not just if it's an act of the body, but if it is a thought in the mind, a look in the eye or lust in the heart. Jesus said someone commits adultery not just when they sleep with someone who is not their husband or wife, but even if they look at someone with lust in their heart. So sexual immorality is anything that takes something designed to make them one with a wife or a husband and gives it to the many. They take something that was designed to be lifelong and permanent and they make it temporary. And something is to make you whole with another person and make it something that you only give part of yourself to. Which means immorality when it comes to the Christian is not just a sleazy bloke in our church who's sleeping with a prostitute. It is anyone taking sex out of this marriage relationship. It could be the man experimenting with bisexual fantasies. It could be the wife refusing to ever have sex with her husband. It could be the man fantasizing about other women whilst he's having sex. It could be a single lady masturbating to Fifty Shades of Grey. It could be two people sleeping together who are unmarried. It could be a teenage lad looking at porn. It could be an older man drugging and raping women. Now I get that there's a scale there. And not all of these things are equally wrong. But if you are united to Jesus, then these things should never be part of you. Roderick, sex is designed to unite a man and a woman in marriage. It is not designed to unite Jesus to sin. Your body is a member of Christ. Shocking, right? Let's keep going. Number three. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 18. Paul continues. Flee sexual morality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? Now, he's used this picture already in 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. I think it was Kenny that took us through it, where he said, as a church community, we are the dwelling place of God. The Spirit dwells in our midst. The amazing thing here is he takes that corporate image and he applies it to you as an individual Christian in regards to your body. 
He says, God has made his sacred home in your body. Your body is his dwelling place and where God is putting himself on display. And just as it would be shocking to unite Jesus to a prostitute, so also it would be scandalous to make the Holy Spirit cohabit with sexual immorality. So you think about God's dwelling place in the Bible. Think about Eden. The Garden of Eden was God's dwelling place with Adam and Eve, but it was so pure that no sin, no evil, no immorality could ever remain there. And so what happened to Adam and Eve when they sinned? They're expelled. Think about God's dwelling places in the Old Testament. The tabernacle tent, the temple building were considered so pure that no evil, no immorality, no evil could ever come in them. And so humans were excluded apart from one man once a year with sacrifice. The rest of the time, humanity expelled and excluded from the beating heart of God's holy dwelling place. Or don't just think Eden, temple, tabernacle, but think the new creation, the Christian's hope of eternity. God's dwelling place forever will be so pure that no evil, no sin, no wickedness, no immorality will ever enter it. Which is why the only people who enter will be those who are sanctified, washed, and justified in Jesus by the Spirit. We saw that last week. Roderick, you need to know that God's house has never tolerated sin, that God's house has always been set apart for absolute purity. And so if the Holy Spirit is at home in your body, it better not also be a home for sexual immorality. If the Spirit moves in, you can be sure that he will start to pack the bags and send off sexual immorality that's been living in your body. In fact, we could pick on Charlie again, right? Up for that? Charlie lived with us for a while, right? And I know what Charlie's living habits are. I think they've improved. I hope they've improved. But he's getting married. And so all the things you could get away with as a man before you were married, you can't get away with anymore. Pee stains on the toilet. <laughs> leaving your stinking football stuff around for a whole week until you play again next week. All right, leaving stuff out in the kitchen. All these things that just like you get away with as a bloke. When Sally moves in, what happens? Charlie is getting battered unless he cleans his life up. The same is true. Just as Sally moving into Charlie's house means that cleanliness must happen, so too when the spirit enters the life of a Christian, sexual immorality goes. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Fourth thing. You are not your own. Sorry, Charlie, I've totally picked on you there. Four, you are not your own. Look at the second half of verse 19. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Remember back to Roderick at the start of the game, right? Roderick comes in, people in Corinth come in and say, I have the right to do anything. Now, that's how most of us lived before we were Christians. We defined ourselves by saying, I can and I will do anything that I want to do. And we would have said back then that that felt like freedom. But the reality was we were enslaved. We weren't our own master, we were mastered. Those of us who battle addiction know this, right? The first time we tried it, it felt like freedom. And then slowly... And subtly, it enslaved us. We were living life by the motto, I have the right to do anything, but the truth is, we were destroying our own lives and the lives of those around us. And we couldn't stop, and we couldn't get out. We lived life saying, I have the right to do anything, when actually the truth was, we had all the rights of a slave. Some of us know this, from our sex lives and our sexuality before we were Christians. Many of us still know the battle now we are Christians. What promised to satisfy left us empty. What promised freedom left us enslaved. And what the world promised to us as life to the full has left us now full of scars. Our sin had mastered us. And our sin would have killed us. Until verse 19 and 20. 
that at that point when we were without hope and without freedom, Jesus bought you. See, as slaves, there was a price on our head. And the price of our freedom was not an envelope full of cash, but was a wooden cross that was stained by blood. Jesus didn't come with his bank details. Jesus came with his body. And the price of your freedom was Jesus' death on a cross. And on the cross, he becomes entangled by the slavery of your sin to give you freedom. And on the cross, Jesus suffers an undeserved death to gift you undeserved life. He bought you with a price, an infinitely costly price. His own blood. Which means this, you are not your own. Listen, Roderick. When you thought you were your own, you were actually enslaved. But now that you belong to Christ, you are actually free. Which means sexual immorality is not just at odds with your future raised body. It's not just scandalous with your present relationship with Jesus. It's not just shocking with your present dwelling with the Holy Spirit. But sexual immorality is this. It is a sin against my redemption. Jesus redeemed me from slavery. He redeemed me by his blood. He redeemed me for freedom. But when I walk back into sexual immorality, I'm saying to Jesus, I don't want freedom anymore. You've wasted your blood. I'm going back to slavery. Here's Paul's big point. You cannot be truly united to Jesus as a Christian and leave your sex life outside of his authority. Because everything Jesus has done, from your redemption at the cross to your resurrection on the last day, means that Jesus owns your body, your body is for him, and your body will only enjoy the freedom it was meant to have as you live a life in obedience to Jesus. He's not just your saviour, he is your Lord. And as your Lord... He comes to us with two major applications off the back of this. One negative, one positive. Look at the first one, negative. Verse 18. He simply says, flee sexual immorality. Now that's the complete opposite of what our culture says when it comes to sex, right? Our culture says, man, flirt with it. Have a fling. The culture says, that actually you might as well go and experiment, try everything, nothing's off limits. And the internet's made it accessible, smartphones have made it hideable, the media's made it normal, the opposite is ridiculed, but God still calls it immoral. And everything in your world may be enticing you to, con- to do what they consider normal, but God the Father who will raise your body, God the Son who's united to your body, God the Spirit who's living in your body, and Jesus who redeemed your body are telling you to flee. Now fleeing sexual sin will look different for different Christians. It's not a one size fits all. Fleeing for you may mean getting rid of your smartphone. Fleeing might look like removing your TV from your room. It might mean moving out with a partner. It might mean not watching certain series on Netflix. It may mean deleting your Facebook account. It may mean removing people's numbers from your phone. It may mean getting rid of certain books. It may look like getting accountability software on your internet usage. (coughs) But fleeing, although it may look like a load of different things for different people, it will always look like fleeing. Lads come and ask me, what am I allowed to do? How close can I get? Where's the line? Here's the line. Flee. And you can tell whether you're fleeing or whether you're flirting. Another bad illustration, but let's see if this works. Street team on a Friday night, right? 60 kids, bunch of adults. What happens when someone turns up with a brand new puppy? (laughs) Everyone, right? All these things. You can tell when someone turns up with a puppy. How can you tell when a wasp has turned up at street team? Everyone runs. Everyone runs. 
There's a massive difference between, I know you don't flirt with a puppy, but between flirting and fleeing. And if you think this is some kind of gray area in the Christian walk, it is not. You flee. Jesus says, in, when he says, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you, in Matthew 5, I tell you that even a man who looks at a woman with lust in his heart has already committed adultery with her. Do you know what he goes on to say next? If your right hand causes you to sin, chop it off. And if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It is better to enter eternity maimed than for your whole body to go into hell. So Roderick, if you are trying to flee sexual immorality, it will not look like perusing websites to choose your next prostitute. It will not look like walking near porno corner down in town. It will not look like watching porn on your laptop. It will not look like flirting with girls. It will look like getting out, running away, not going near. Guess what? Fleeing will look like fleeing. But Paul doesn't just give the negative. He gives the positive. Verse 20. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. How hard is it to run away from cake, by the way? Cake's amazing, and if you love cake, it's hard not to think about anything but cake when a cake is in the room. And so to say no to cake, you need to say and be motivated by something bigger and better. Like what? I can say no to the cake because I need to get into that dress for the wedding. Or I can say no to the cake because I want to have a better, fitter, healthier future for my kids. Or I can say no to the cake because I'm running the marathon next month. You need to have something bigger and better to run to, otherwise you will just run back to the cake. Does that make sense? See, the only way you can stand for a Christian view of sex and relationships in the face of a massive wave of cultural pressure to cave in is if you remember the magnitude of what God has done for you in the gospel. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. See, I will honor God with my body for this reason. He redeemed my body in the past. He's dwelling in my body in the present. And he is going to raise my body in the future. And so what I do with my body will not be determined by what culture tells me is my right. But it will be determined by what my God says is right. Now we need to remember... Back in chapter 5, it is not the place, it is no business of Christians to judge those who are not Christians. It's not our place. Paul said that. But this will be the place where as Christians we are perceived to be judgmental. This is a place where we may be tempted not just to cave in to indulge our own sexual appetites, but also to cave into the cultural pressure just to gain the acceptance of our friends or our colleagues. This will be the battleground which will prove whether or not we honor God or we dishonor God. And that is true both in the privacy of our own bedroom, but also in our public relationships at work or in our families. And so we need to get the bigness of what Paul is saying about our bodies. Your body will be raised. Your body is a member of Christ. Your body is a temple of the Spirit. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, Christian, Roderick, you flee sexual immorality and you run to honor the God who has redeemed you.